one of the more interesting uh, and possibly profound things we figured out uh, through Carhartt's training is his emphasis on continuity. So can you talk a little bit about what, what exactly is this continuity that he was trying to convey to you and maybe some of its importance and difficulty? Um, okay. It's big. It's a big topic. Yeah. yeah. So in the West, we learn combinations, which you can string together to be very long combinations, but they're sets of things. Mm. The way that Golden Age fighters, and especially Karahat, fights is like, it's not a combination but in the way that a combination flows together, like each thing goes to the next, the reason you punch here so that you can punch here and the shoulder comes back, blah, 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 is that it's, it's endless. So the entire fight is a combination in mm. a sense, and it can change midway through. What's, what's crazy to me is that he can change what he's doing after he's already launched the kick or the punch or whatever, and it just continues into the next movement to alter it into something else. Um, nothing stops. Like, there are phrasings, like pauses between things where he's doing different movements, or like it kind of crescendos and then kind of comes down to a thing, but it doesn't, the orchestration never stops. Like, it, it keeps playing. Mm. Um, and this is shockingly hard to do. <laughs> it's like, Again, using the example of language, right. is um, if you know how to say some things in a foreign language, you can say those some things, and then there's like a pause or an interruption or a like expected response. When you mm. ask where's the bathroom, you know what right, left, and down the hall is kind mm. of thing, but if someone tries to engage in a full conversation with you, if you don't have fluency, it's very hard to not have stops between mm. those concepts and exchanges of information um, and so a really good conversation like an interesting conversation my dinner with Andre most boring movie in the world unless you can understand and follow the conversation when you're seeing two golden age legends fight you're following the conversation like you're not just seeing which awesome word someone comes up with like midway through the conversation it's the entire thing um and that's this continuity is that um it's not necessarily the individual strikes or the individual combos or like that was an amazing particular move that was a crescendo but it's part of this entire expression that's going on it's interesting that you use a a, a musical analogy it strikes me from what you were saying that it's almost like he's continuously composing. It's almost like as a fighter, you are mixing the notes together in a composition that does not end. Yeah, he's... Until the last bell. He's improvising. Like, it's like a jam session kind of thing. Mm. Which and does not end. It, it doesn't end. And you can kind of like go in the wrong direction but pull it back together by listening to the mm. other members in the group kind of thing mm. um, and I'm <laughs> I'm that guy learning to play guitar who hits the wrong note and goes wait wait <laughs> what? <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> like starts over not a jam session that guy's not invited <laughs> he's gonna he's screw up your garage band um, so the enemy of continuous composition is maybe trying to make sure you do not make a mistake or make sure you hit the right note. Yeah, because what's the right note? The right note is just a note that sounds good in that moment. It's not like it doesn't have to be a D. Like, right. right? Um, but there are notes that would go against that, which is like when you kick his block <laughs> for no reason. like Not a sour note, but the wrong note kind of thing. And then there are sour notes where you like get yourself slammed in the face by like... But what he's teaching you is when you hit the sour note, you don't stop the composition. No, you you then 
then you then go to the sweet note mm -hmm. after the sour note, mm -hmm. which is a kind of like emotional recovery almost. Totally. Yeah. Totally. It's like when you're talking, people who are fluent in a language say the wrong word sometimes. And you just go, uh, I meant this other word. And you just correct it and say the other word. You're not like, oh my God, my sentence is ruined. Like, <laughs> you just say the, just say the next word. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting. We were you were interviewing uh, Siri Moncon, fighter of the year in 1973, and we were trying to get from him some perspective on how is the fighting of your era or the of his era or the Golden Age era after. How does it compare with today's fighting? And it, he immediately went into the co the complaint about the clinch today, and it's made. I suddenly dawned on me what the complaint about the clinch is, is not that there's so much clinch. Diesel Noy, in the late 80s and early 90s, was a clinch fighter. He's considered one of the great fighters ever. It's that now the clinch ends the exchange, mm -hmm. that it stops the conversation. And this is like, as the, as the Westerner who's looking for the knockout, that's to end the conversation. Like, Everyone's trying to end the conversation now mm -hmm. at any point. Whereas the joy of the golden age, the celebration of technique, is really about continuing the conversation. And when you're winning the conversation, you're like, I would like to keep talking mm -hmm. because you're just going to keep looking bad. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a very big difference about the celebration of continuity in the golden age and before and the way that maybe even contemporary high-level Muay Thai is fought now. Yeah, which is not only the fighters, but also the refing. Like, they used to let the clinch go, so it could develop. Um, right, in the golden age when clinch <laughs> fighters match, matched up, they could be in the clinch for minutes at Yeah, a but time. It, was, it was interesting because I've heard fighters from the past complain about how now everyone's just clinch and knee. I've heard that one before. I've heard about how gambling has ruined Muay Thai, but I've never heard someone explain visually the difference of this continuity. He was actually complaining that people get tired now. He's like, in my day, people didn't get tired. Like, you would just keep moving, keep going. Now people, like, do this burst, and then they're like, <gasps> which is an expression of the, like, stopping kind of thing. Um, and this, like, you try to get one crescendo, like, one big flurry, and then the rest is just kind of a wash, mm. like a muddle or something. Like you, I've fought very good fighters who really only fight 20 seconds out of each round. Mm. And that's, they're skilled. They're skilled in this kind of fighting. Right. But that shouldn't be everybody. Like that's actually pretty, uh, the, the way that fights could be really close and like constantly flip like this was because of that continuity. Whereas now it's like mm. there's one big thing and then was there another big thing or not? What do you, how do you feel, or do you feel that part of the enemy of continuity is breaking things into offense and defense? Like, I'm on offense, I'm on defense. See, I don't know whether things are taught that way, or if there's just not enough experience to blend those lines. Mm. Like... For sure, people have like toggle switches now that's like, this is an offensive move, this is a defensive move, and when you're going forward, you're offensive, and then you kind of have to do, okay, now go into defense kind of thing. Um, but I don't know that that's like conceptually taught, or if there's just not enough. Well, talk about of yourself, your own struggles with continuity. Like what has, you compared it to feeling like you were drowning on that one storm session. Yeah, because when you're swimming, you're swimming and breathing. Like, they're one thing. Whereas my ability and a lot of people's ability is you are either swimming or breathing. <laughs> they don't, they don't mm. go together as, like, united strokes, that breathing is part of the stroke. Mm. Um, and... Samart made a, made a really big point when he was training me about, like, you anticipate being hit, and you have that 
defense ready. It's like part of the move. It's the same way that like when you learn a punch, bringing it back to guard is part of the move. Mm-hmm. Like this is not the punch, and then I don't know what happens after that. It's like starts here, goes here, comes back here. That's a punch kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but those are point A back to point A. It's not like when it comes back here, you already have the way Chart Chai teaches, where like the defense comes back to the next punch to like flow everything together. Okay, what are you, what are you pointing out with that difference? I'm what, saying what that, does that like, mean? because everything is broken into pieces or like small couples or something, people will totally practice a block and then a kick, but it's not block, kick, block, punch, block, punch, like this whole it's ready at all the time. It's like you, you break it into a piece that's like you can block and kick back kind of thing. Is that good or bad? That's just how it is, which is not this like fluidity of offense and defense. It's like one is a defensive move and one is an offensive move rather than that they like totally work together like blending the colors together or something. Okay. That doesn't make sense to you? What are you advocating for? I'm saying that if you if you only ever work on the block and kick as this like after you kick they're probably gonna kick back and so you block and you stop the phrase there mm. you have to expand it's the same thing when you're learning clinch you can't drill clinch throws or clinch moves and leave it at that because it all flows together like you have to be able to feel where everything is and that's just from endlessly going and so you clinch for an hour Mm. so that you get into terrible positions and come Mm. out of them get into good positions and move into bad positions and it just keeps moving Mm. i think that that's what char chai is talking about when he talks about how people used to spar all the time and that's what gave them feeling and that's why the fighters were so much better is that they just sparred all the time and without without shin pads yeah so they felt everything um And I think it's that kind of, like, they literally had continuity, so they learned continuity, whereas we, like, time clock things and and break things. That's interesting, because Thailand clinch training, which, you like you say, you go for half hour, hour, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. That's that's most like maybe the older way of training, where there's just continuity of batting good positions over and over and over again. You're just spilling out a melody that's always changing. But sparring, breaking it into rounds, everything is like stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. Maybe really the way that people train striking now, even in Thailand, like in good gyms, is is not the same as it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah, because I think that part of it comes from really good intentions, like... Um, Simulating a fight or... Simulating a fight. There's this very strong, like, sports science thing with the, like, hit drills. And they're like, why would I run 10 kilometers when a fight is uh, fast twitch bursts? That makes sense, right? To, like, run sprints because in a fight you do, like, bursts of energy kind of thing. Sure. Except what you learn from, like, just keep going for 10 kilometers and, like, moderate yourself. And when you get tired, you have to, like, figure out how to keep your pace and like pull it together and all of these different things it's not about taking exactly this and exactly this to like put the pieces together because they're similar yeah it's it's like um you're a a cold call telecommun what are they called people who like call your house and ask you to vote or whatever okay your conversations are like super short because you're just trying to get something done and people are gonna hang up on you really quickly. Mm. So you only ever speak in two minute bursts. Mm. It's like, you have to have conversations like in the world to be able to learn shortcuts to how you're gonna get someone to keep talking to you. You don't learn that in a two minute conversation. You learn that in a 15 minute conversation. Yeah, you have to learn the the full language. Yeah. It's for some reason I'm having this association when you're talking about, it appeals to me this idea that there is a different concept of time or narrative that was being expressed in the golden age or before in fighting that now everything is very modular the the combination being like almost like a prototypical idea like these three strikes 
four strikes, five strikes in a row will accomplish points that will win you the round. What really comes to my mind, strangely, is like oral poets in the Homeric age used to memorize entire books entire like the the epic was memorized yeah. and they would recite it for hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. a relationship to language and continuity that we just do not have anymore mm -hmm. and there, it feels a little bit like that that the golden age fighters like when you're in the ring with Karahat and he's just like just keep going do not stop but over and over in your mind you tell yourself, I have to stop. Like, can you talk a little bit about that impulse to stop at all times? Like, to criticize yourself, to adjust, like, try to, like, improve what you just did, correct mistakes. Like, there's a big thing between, like, I'm going to stop and correct the error I just made and recognize it as an error, and the other impulse, which is, I'm going to correct the error I just made by moving to the next thing. Like going, letting it wash downstream. They're very different concepts about error and what to do. Um, I, I don't, it's, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it differently than what you just said. And well, what's like, your experience? Because like you're in the ring. Like if, you're not, if you're not moving your arms and kicking at the same time, you don't stop and like separate those things and then try to bring them back together and all this stuff. Like just keep swimming mm. and it'll like solve itself or like smooth itself out. Um, I have that in like micro moments, like when Chuck Chai is making me burn and like just throw like 20 crosses. Mm. And I don't get tired, which is incredible. Because I have so much tension mm. that you would think that throwing 20 crosses would make me tired. And he's amazed I don't get tired. He's like, usually I get Muay Thai fighters in here who can't go two rounds with me. Mm. He's like, you make me tired. So I'm relaxed enough that I can do it physically, mm. but mentally so tense that I can't mm. feel. And so I'm, there are times that I can make those adjustments while I'm just doing the repetition. Mm. But I don't know, maybe it's like, tennis or ping pong where you just keep hitting the ball like if you hit it slightly off on your mallet or you like hit the rim if you then stop and like reconsider how you're holding your thing and then like how you're throwing it and all of this stuff like you really just want to keep making the corrections while you're moving mm -hmm. um because they're so small like they're such tiny corrections um that stopping and starting again, it's like bad science where you're like not recreating the same. There was a, there was a moment this uh, to, in today, I think it was today's session, where you were frustrated, you were with Church Eye, and you were frustrated that you were off balance mm -hmm. during a particular combination he was throwing. He was having you throw over and over. No, I was shadow boxing at the end, and I was just throwing a particular combination was off balance. Yeah, you were, okay, you were off balance, and there was, and you just were stopping, and you were like so frustrated that you're off balance, and I'm like, it doesn't matter, keep going. And you're like, no, it matters. I'm not, I'm doing something wrong and I don't want to practice the wrong, thing. the wrong thing. Like there's a big fear that if I don't correct what I'm doing, I'm going to ingrain a bad habit, mm. which is like my feet in the wrong position or something like that. And at the time I was just thinking to myself, it would be like being on a surfboard and being frustrated with your balance. And so hopping off the surfboard. Yeah, let me get off the board and think about it. <laughs> and <That> think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. if I just put my toe a little two inches more to the left, my balance would be better. Maybe you're right, but really the way that you learn surfing or any balance kind of thing is by trying to stay on the well, board. You still, you still have that thought and you still have that correction, but you do it on the board. Like if you fall off, sure, get back on kind mm. of thing, but if you're slightly off but I wasn't like falling over mm, I was like no. this it's doesn't just a little feel thing. right it felt wrong yeah um I don't know it's like when you put a backpack on and the straps are wrong and you adjust the straps while wearing it you don't take it off <laughs> and adjust it and then put it back on you're like that's still wrong and you take it off and adjust it and put it back on it's still wrong like, you know that's I mean? a very good analogy 
That's a very good analogy. So, what is required to gain that kind of patience with oneself? It feels like we're so, especially you, because you're very cerebral, you really trust your brain to like think about something and try to figure out the answer, which you then can apply. And it feels like at a certain point, one has to trust one's body, like the organism, like we're animals. The organism is going to figure out what the homeostasis is, like the way to make all the parts move together. Like how does one relinquish control really of the mind? And maybe you could talk a little bit about Vipassana and self one and self two of the inner game of tennis. Um, it's a big question, but it's too big of a question. <clears throat> I think that there, there are natural learning processes that we don't over analyze because we haven't constructed them as things that require a lot of outside authority to make it work. Mm. This is the very weird thing about being a Westerner in Thai culture, mm. is that as Westerners, we kind of understand the like martial art master hierarchy that's like, ooh, my crew calling him sir and like all of this stuff that's like, I'm going to be um, deferential in this and you are going to guide me Sensei, all sensei this stuff. Yeah. Um, that's false in a number of ways. Uh, one of which is that nobody comes into the ring with you. <laughs> people, people give you their knowledge, but you have to figure it out on your own. Like you have to. You have to make it your own. Yeah, but you have to even really digest it and understand mm. it kind of thing um, it's like if, if someone told you which plants were edible mm. and you never ate them you just knew which ones were mm. edible and then you starved to death because you never eat them right and so like you didn't eat the wrong ones either <laughs> which is good <laughs> like you know which ones you should eat but you just don't do it and then there's this um the, the Thai culture is that you totally have this respect for your teacher, both from their position and their age and just the hierarchy of society. But while you're deferent to them socially and like you do what you're told, they say go do 200 knees, you fucking go do 200 knees, you do not expect them to like download Kung Fu into you. Mm. It's like you you do the work. You mm. eat the plants. Like They put you on the path, you walk the path. Yeah, and if they don't tell you, it's not like, my crew didn't teach me blah, blah, blah. It's like you fucking wait. Like, maybe they'll show you, maybe they won't kind of thing. And you watch the others. Or you look others. at others. You look at that others. That was the yeah. insane thing. Not insane at all. Beautiful thing about Siri Mon Khan. Mm. Interviewing oh, him. yeah. That was incredible. He started when he was 17, which is young in the West. Not young in Thailand. <laughs> like, that's old to be starting Muay Thai. Starting Muay Thai. Yeah. And he was self taught. And when we were like, well, how did you learn? Like, when he finally went from his uh, province to Bangkok to like join a real gym, we were like, well, how did you learn? Like, how did they develop your style? And he's like, I would go to the fights and watch the corner men, and they would be giving advice to a fighter, and I would listen. When he kicks you, what do you do? This guy is punching you too much. What do you do? You're winning already. What do you do? Like, he just, like, watched and listened and just took everything in. Even he's, before that, before he got to Bangkok, we were asking him, how did you even start learning Muay Thai? He goes, I just shadow boxed and yeah. listened to the radio. Yeah. Like, he went on a personal journey and really didn't even know Muay Thai. Totally. But that's... That is the same knowledge that we expect to be given from our teachers, mm. and he's just picking it up. It's free. It's mm. the plants on the ground. You can eat all of them when you know which ones to eat. Mm. You don't wait for your teacher who told you which ones you can eat to then pick it and bring it over to you and mm. prepare a salad for you. You know which ones to eat. You go get mm. based on that knowledge. Like, you want to know something, you listen. They're telling someone else all of this stuff. 
And so the way that Siri Mon Khan learned is continuity. He's always listening. He is always watching. Mm. It's not like, okay, well, I've lied to my crew and now I have two hours to learn of a lesson. this yeah. and yeah. then when I go home I stop thinking about it. Like yeah. you've punched your when you're clock. when you're describing this, this is what's really you're making my mind turn. <laughs> it's so beautiful. When you walk into a I'll call it a real Muay Thai gym, which is a Kai Muay, which is a gym that has young Thai fighters coming up to become stadium fighters, right? It's they, They're not there just to teach Westerners. They might teach Westerners too, as part of their business model, but mostly they exist to grow fighters. When you walk into that space, it is like a garden of edible foods that can all be good for you. It's not just what the crew is going to teach you when he's standing in front of you. Like, I understand why people come to Thailand and they really do want instruction because this is the land of techniques and knowledge. But everywhere around you, if you know what plants to eat, is just you can feast on everything. It's like everything is edible. Willy Wonka. It's like Willy Wonka. Everything, every time you look at a Thai, young or old, on the bag, you can learn something from what they're doing. Totally, even if they're doing it wrong. Even I watch people do things wrong all the time and I'm like, this is super informative. Like, I probably do that. Like, I can see where his balance is off. Totally, and you also get, in these kinds of gyms, you get not only the crew, but you get these, like, pad men circling through that are journeymen sometimes, or fairly un- low in social status. There is a life, there is a whole ecology of knowledge in a gym like Petron Rung, or many of these gyms that is just full of things if that like if Siri Mong Khan is like I'm just hungry to learn and he can shadow box from the radio this is a feast really it's very very interesting how that plays into continuity mm-hmm. because you're like it's not just a lesson that occurs in the hour that you spend with your crew mm-hmm. or the 15 minutes on pads but it's exposure like, you have to be exposed to it. If you go to a gym where nobody knows what they're doing, there's nothing to look at. Like, you have to have... Siri Moncon was looking at yes. fights. He didn't have, like, Yodmoy at the temple fights where he was fighting. Those were temple fights. We've seen temple fights. They're scrappy. Yeah. Like, but it's, it's beautiful in a way because it's this free expression of the heart of the art that then gets, like, reined in and, like... He told this incredible story. This is a small diversion, but it's an incredible story how he didn't really know Muay Thai, like, for very... He wasn't proficient at it. My Ben. <laughs> yeah, my yeah. Ben. And he fought on a temple fight, and he killed his opponent, well, his opponent unexpectedly. Yeah. A knee to the chest, and he died. Yeah. And then... But th- that's not the point. Fight. In yeah. a, Like his third fight or something yeah. ever. And then... But he was thrown, because of this death... He was then thrown into a world where everybody thought he must be this deadly fighter, and he had to live up to this reputation he, he suddenly also had. Couldn't they called him yeah. the executioner? Yeah, which sucks. You're like constantly reminded of this horrible thing. He's 73 years old. He got goosebumps when he was talking about yeah. that man dying. Um, but oh. he's like, when I went to Bangkok, he was accused of throwing his fight. Because he sucked, because he didn't, didn't actually know Muay Thai, but he's called the executioner. They're like, he killed a man in the ring, yeah. and he's losing to this guy. He's throwing the fight, and he has, like, five fights. But within, was it five years, six years, he be, was the he's best Yodmoy. fighter in Thailand. He was a Yodmoy. Yeah. It just shows you, you get thrown into circumstances, surrounded by knowledge, and you're hungry for it. But it was the same, it was the same thing that Karhat said. Karhat's dad... Yeah. Loved Muay Thai. So, if your dad loves Muay Thai, you do Muay Thai. And Karhat didn't know anything. He had never trained anywhere. He had never trained Muay Thai. And they put him in a festival fight or something. And he wins. And so now it's like you've got this win against someone. I think he said he had 20 fights. The first guy he fought had 20 fights. And yeah. Karhat won. And so they're like, oh my god. Like, yeah. see on. Yeah. So, so, they just start putting him in fights. 
And then his dad lies about his proficiency and experience to get him in a gym in Bangkok, but he lives up to it. He well, becomes he li- he, fucking Sion. He, but he gets thrown into a Bangkok gym with no composite skills not up to the level of his reputation. This same thing happened to Siri, Siri Mon Khan. And you're right, he was a Mon- he was a knee fighter, mm-hmm. Muay Khao fighter, mm-hmm. and he somehow transformed himself into one of the great female fighters ever. But just by like trying to survive in this knowledge rich environment. Mm-hmm. And, and the same fish. thing we hear the same story from Yodsonon. Yeah. He's like Everyone, I was the worst in the gym. They, they tell the all sell the same story. But with Yotsunan, there was no. Well, his is t- his too. Yotsunan loved Muay Thai. Right. Loved Muay Thai, and he wasn't gifted. He wasn't bad, but he wasn't gifted. He said nobody in the gym would think anything. But, of but him. he's like, I just had so much heart. He's yeah. like, I just had the biggest heart. He would obsess over what he could have done better that day and all this stuff. And then the part that's like these other two yes. is that he goes. His friend is supposed to fight, and his friend gets sick and can't fight, so they throw Yotsunon in because they're the same size. But Yotsunon does not have the skill and experience that his friend had. It was a boxing fight, though. No, it wasn't. It was a Muay Thai fight. Oh. And he punched the guy and knocked him out with, like, ten seconds or something in the first round. He just, like, nailed him, and the guy's out. And so then they're like, you need to go talk to uh, Yotong. And they're like, "Uh, you're going to be a boxer. And he's like, I love Muay Thai. And they're like, you're a boxer now. <laughs> it's like this expectation of capacity. From and then you have to, but then you have to live under the, the expectation, but you're given a garden of knowledge. Yeah. He's in the Sityotong gym, yeah. surrounded by great fighters, among them some art, mm-hmm. uh, Kong Tor and Ni, mm-hmm. great boxers. Mm-hmm. And he becomes a great, an amazing boxer because he loves training and he just eats all the plants. He's like, I'll be good at this then since I can't do it. Even to this day, though, he's like, I love training. You, you can see it when you watch him. You can see just training. the shadow boxing or anything. He is just feeding on it. But it, it goes back to that continuity that there's no break, there's no stop in the composition. It's very, very beautiful. I wanted to be the lead singer, but I happened to be awesome at drums. <laughs> but not only that, there's something about these are kind of like hero stories. They're, totally. they're epic hero totally. stories, and it almost is a little bit suspicious that they're all similar. Mm. Like, this is the story that you shape for yourself because this is a this is a hero's epic. Like you accidentally, like King Arthur, you accidentally pulled the sword out of the stone. Well, you're like chosen instead of yeah you're chosen in some strange way yeah. but uh, probably at the time you're just feeding off of all the plants in the garden that you're in mm-hmm. that's very interesting what do you, what can you say I'm like deep so to me this is a deeper question and you don't always follow me on this this idea of the edit the way that we learn consciously to edit what's happening and, and insert our our narrator, our critical voice. The self one, self two. Like, how does that mix in with this story? Because when you talk, when you deal with Thai trainers, they all say the same thing. This nap, this tam, what is it? Natural. Tamachat. Tamachat. Be natural. Like Pinu says it. Just today, Karahat was like laughing at the switch step that people do on a kick he's like no you just walk forward mm-hmm. like literally like you're walking down the sidewalk mm-hmm. you you switch stance but not like in some dramatic way you take your other foot and you put it in front of your foot like you would if you're walking uh, some art is the same way his movements are like a person standing or walking on the street mm-hmm. I think that this is related to that concept of continuity for the Thai, this naturalness of movement. What can you say about that? (laughs) Well, it feels like in watching one of your big um, difficulties and struggles is that you do not let 
this natural movement move without lots of critical voice, lots of correction. Like, the, like with Karat, you know that one of the aims is continuity, continuity, continuity. Do not stop after a mistake. But it's so ingrained to like do this self one commentary. It's almost like you have to have a sports announcer making judgments about whether something is is succeeding or not. Not you. I think this is part of a difference between the Thai and the Western brain almost. We're very self-policing. Yeah. I I don't know. I think I think it's that like you do Muay Thai. I always well. find that that verb really interesting, but there's no way to Unpack replace it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that in the way that we conceive of like doing Muay Thai or doing yoga or you don't do soccer, you play soccer. Right. right. In Thailand, I mean, you play Muay Thai. Like. Mm. There is a natural element to it. Mm. For us, you're either talented or you're not, mm. kind of thing. For Thais, there's talent also. They talk about talent, but mm. it's like whether God gave you a gift or not. Mm. But that doesn't mean if you're untalented, you can't do it. Mm. Um, it just means that some things are easier mm. for those people, kind of thing. Um, but I think that from my understanding of Vipassana and this your identity is com falsely comprised of these two elements. One is your body as you, which it's not, and your mind as you, which it's not. There is no I. But these two things, being receptors for sensation, will receive sensation because there is sensation in the world, and then you attach aversion or pleasure or I did that or I didn't kind of thing. So. It's, it's one of these things where, like, you find out some science-y thing where your mind is blown, where you're like, I decided to move my hand like this. Mm. And you're like, it actually moved before you, it's so oh, yeah, fast yeah, yeah, it yeah, moved yeah. before you thought it, and you're like, yeah. that doesn't make any sense, my body's not, like, acting <laughs> on its own. But it does. When I get fucking tired in round five, and I just don't care anymore because mm. I've been hit, my blocks are so fast because I'm not thinking about them mm. at all. I'm not thinking block. Mm. I don't even see it. It just goes. Mm. Tamatat. That's mm. nature. It's like you let it take over kind mm. of thing. And I think that because Nama, you're like conscious mind, it's it's the I we love the most mm. because we can take credit for shit. Mm. We're like, I blocked. <laughs> it's like you think you did, but the block actually went before you thought it. Like it it did it on its own. And you totally don't want to give your body credit unless you're like Oh, what an amazing machine that I made a baby. Like, what, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. People find some things about their bodies really amazing and some things about their bodies really disgusting. Mm. I'm like, what is physically wrong with me that I can't do this thing? Because mentally, I can do anything. Like, mm. my brain can figure out anything. I, if I do something well, I take credit for it. If I do something badly, it's like, what sure, is, I should fault. be able to yeah. think my way through this kind yeah. of thing. Like, I can't think my way through dengue fever. <laughs> like, yeah. you just, it your, just happens. Your like, body dengue is through. happening, and you fucking pass out and wake up on the floor. Like, oh, if I'd thought harder, I wouldn't have, like, yeah. crashed on the floor. Like, you, you don't have control over those things. Um, and so I think that the way that we divide that up into, like, doing Muay Thai and learning Muay Thai and all of this stuff, like, there are things that we learn in a completely natural way that we don't take credit for. I'm not like, I really learned how to walk. Like, I'm a genius. Mm. You call your baby smart when they learn how to walk. Like, oh, he's so smart he can potty on his own kind of thing. And it's like, that's gonna happen eventually as long as you don't like leave it in the backyard or something. And then we ascribe cleverness or uncleverness to how long that took how early it was and all of these different things and so I think that we why are you thinking about babies 
Because that's a natural learning process that you don't think about because it happens when you're so young. Mm. You are not thinking your way through walking. And you're not right. thinking your way through falling on your ass. You just get back up. Like, or don't. So in a way, you have to become more like a child or a baby Stop to learn more time. It. Stop overthinking it. I lied to get my first bartending job. I did not know how to bartend. I didn't know what was in anything unless it was called vodka tonic, in which case it <laughs> describes what's in it mm. by itself. But I learned how to do it by just doing it. Mm. And because I knew that I didn't know how to do it and I'd put myself in this position where I had to fake it, um, I didn't expect to be better at it than I was mm. kind of thing. I didn't expect to be good at Muay Thai for the first mm. year mm. that I was learning. And now that I've been doing it for 10 years, I expect to be mm. capable of some things. Mm. I don't think I don't know how to walk if I trip on something. This shit happens. Like, you trip right. sometimes. And you, like, sorry, you correct yourself. Like, you catch yourself. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you don't. Depends on how you trip. Yeah. So, like, I can be perfectly capable of throwing that kick that... When Karahat is like, I don't understand when you're just playing around, your kick is great. And then when I ask you to do it, you can't do it. It's because he asked me to do it. So now I'm like, I'm going to throw that kick. And it all goes into Nana, right. who does not know how to throw a kick. Nana's like, I know how to throw a kick because I know the mechanics. I've verbalized it. Yeah. But nothing about throwing the kick is verbal or intellectual. The body just does it. Right. So if I could just be like, let the body do it, I've done it before. Like kick, bag, go, kind of thing. Right. Like, if I'm going to stand up, I'm not like, well, I need to angle my foot this way before I put the other foot down like this. I'm actually probably going to fuck it up. Yeah. Because I'm overthinking it. Totally. But if I, like, hear the phone ring and I'm like, oh, I got it. Yeah. Right? You just get up. So, how are you going to, now you've trained six weeks with Karahat, with this continuity journey, encountered all kinds of, like, rough patches, trying to do it with him. You're now bringing this knowledge and these goals that he's like made you aware. He's changed your eyes. He's made you aware of things you have to access in yourself. And now you're going back to your home gym, much like people do when they come to Thailand for six weeks and then they go back in the West to their gym. You're going back to your home gym, your trainer that you love, Pinu. Training with Pinu developed you thus far. How are you going to try to import continuity into your old training habits and patterns? Like, how are you going? How does one safeguard the thing they learned? Because it's it's the same thing that Karahat showed me the path, and he's like, just walk on it, mm. and now I just have to walk on it. It's weird. It's like a kung fu movie. It's totally like a kung fu movie <laughs> because honestly. If I kept training with him for a year, like if we didn't yes. go home, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I kept training with him for a year, but I expected him to download Carhartt, yeah, it still wouldn't me, happen. It wouldn't work. It would never. It wouldn't happen. If, yeah. If I go away and never see him again, which hopefully is not the case, I would die. Yeah. Um. What he's shown me, if you can feel it, you can continue. Do it's so kung fu. It's, it's, like, it's so weird. It's, it's very. St <laughs> it's so strange. <laughs> it's, it's so strange. You have to walk the path, even when you're training with the master. It's so funny. What's funny about a little bit ironic is that Karahat's fight name is Sion, which no, is. No, that's his real name. I mean, his real name, but Yod Sion is his nickname, right? Yeah, which is a play on his real name. Yeah. So his fight name. Yeah. Well, his nickname. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and explain what Yodzian is. <clears throat> it's actually hard to explain. I know. Sion means like super skilled, super gifted. It's often used for gamblers of like that guy is fucking always right. Like he always picks the right one. Like if you are Sion as a gambler, you're like the god of gambling. But it just means like otherworldly able, but it comes from the Chinese of Xi'an, which is like a... It's a Rusi. It's like a Rusi. It's, it's a like Rusi. A teacher. What is a Rusi in Thailand? A Rusi in Thailand is this, like, hermit in the woods who knows fucking everything and can, like, encounter tigers. <laughs> and like, is a okay, magician and, is and knows magic, So good and bad magic. We actually falsely 
interpreted his name as wizard because it can mean wizard, but that's not what they mean when they say it, but it does mean that. It, it's the it, way we think of a wizard, like Merlin. It means Carhot's that. Merlin. It means that. But not that. only is he Xion, which is his, like, name, it's his, his, when he was born, it became his play name, but he became Yotzian because he was just so otherworldly. Other He's the sphere in the two-dimensional world that when people saw him, they were like, Yotzian. But Rusi, he's a Rusi in the Thai concept, yeah. which basically is like is a knowledge. yogi, yeah. a, a wise man that is that can float, Unless basically. Kevin likes the magi. Yeah, the magi. The, what I'm saying is... The Jedi. It is, Jedi master. It, which is what, what's his name calls him. David. Dave calls him. But that literally, it is a kung fu movie. Totally. Like when you go to the guy on the mountain with the long white beard and white eyebrows, mm. that's what. It's kind of weird. You were crying. Kevin was crying the other day because we watched the scene of the. Oh, the crazy monkey style. What was it called? He's the bitter monk. The bitter monk in doesn't the iron, teach anybody. In the iron monkey. He doesn't teach anybody because the style is too hard. Yeah. And the student comes and like puts himself before the bitter monk who just keeps himself in the corner of the monastery away from everybody and he's like, I want to learn this style. And the monk is so disappointed when he learns that he was sent there by somebody and the guy's like, but it was my choice, I still want to learn it. And then he just gets thrown around and has to endure, which honestly, being in the ring with Karahat is like someone doing magic tricks around you and like you're hallucinating <laughs> and like it's totally it feels it's like it's totally that. like a kung fu movie where you have to like go through this um trial in order to even be taken as a student except that he's so generous that he's like i'll just show you everything over and over he's like it's like what's interesting also in this whole process is that he constantly increased the difficulty but not because he's being some kind of uh this is how to instruct someone. <laughs> Can you imagine? He's so not like that. <laughs> no, but he constantly increased the degree of difficulty simply because that was the water level. Yeah. Like, we're having a conversation. Oh, you're using bigger words. Well, I'm going to use bigger words. Kind of thing. And I'm going to frustrate you. Time for all <laughs> So it's very, I don't know, very special that you've had this experience, but that also that you know that now you have the path and you have to walk it yourself. I've had to walk it myself this whole time. It's just, I thought he was holding my hand through it. <laughs> and then it turned out I was holding my own hand. <laughs> it's like a magic trick. <laughs> okay, we can end it there. <laughs> oh, that was really good. Rambly, but good. told me to come here, to learn the monkey fist style. So you were ordered to come here, not of your own free will. Leave me. Teacher, it was my choice. Is that the truth? I know the monkey fist is difficult, and that it will restrict me as well. But I want to learn. Good. The technique is most complex. But if you learn it well, you'll beat the rest. It's superior to all other techniques. But you may not succeed. I shall do my best. Hey! <coughs>